Stephen Hicks is a philosopher at Rockland University and the author of numerous books including Explaining Postmodernism, Nietzsche and the Nazis, The Art of Reasoning, and other books. We spoke yesterday about postmodernism and its effects on politics, culture, and society, and the contemporary left. Stephen Hicks, how are you? I am well, Michael Reckenwald. A pleasure to uh, see you in action. Thanks. It's great to see you, too. Um, yeah. So I thought we'd talk about some things. Uh, there are so many things that I, I've been wanting to run by you and mm. hear your thoughts about. Yeah, vice versa. Uh, okay, great. Then we could have some things to say. So um, let's just cut to the chase. Do you think... Um, do you think the current contemporary left is Rousseauian in nature? I mean, uh, is this an anti-civilizational movement? Yeah, that's a that's a strong question. So, yeah, the, the left has been really dominated by Marxisms and neo-Marxism for much of the late 1800s, and certainly you know much, much of the first part of the 20th century. Uh, and that tends to obscure people's understanding that uh, you know there's dozens and dozens of versions of socialisms and collectivisms kicking around, and Marxism was was one that uh, that came to dominate. Um, and prior to from Marx, uh, Rousseau and his followers in the 1800s uh, were making a pretty good good run of it. Uh, sometimes it's under neglected that the the leaders in the third phase of the French Revolution when it got really nasty and spilled into the reign of terror. So Robespierre, Marat, Saint-Just and others were all disciples of, of Rousseau. Mm -hmm. uh, now what that means though is uh, that the kind of leftism is, uh, is not Marxist because Marxism is kind of high tech. Uh, it's arguing that yeah. capitalism and the industrial revolution are going to you know, advance civilization. Uh, but the Rousseauians have always been much more low tech and tribalist. So various back to nature uh, uh, live, uh, and of course, this is a kind of a stereotype, you live on the hippie commune uh, yeah. kind of left. That's much more, much more Rousseauian. Uh, uh, Marxism always built itself as a kind of a scientific socialism, right, or uh, that it was doing social science. So we could look at the evidence and the data and, and make various predictions that we would put it to the test. But what you find in Rousseauianism is that it's much more passion-based and uh, uh, feeling-based. Uh, and that, and uh, even more strongly, the idea that reason is this Johnny-come-lately phenomenon that just serves as after-the-fact rationalizations. Mm -hmm. And so what you need to do is not be too intellectual, not too verbal, not too theoretical, but rather go with, go with your instincts. So you know, I think your question is, is spot on worth exploring that when the left, particularly in the 1960s, was moving away from the old left that had been dominated by Marxism, and it was widely disillusioned and, and dispirited and groping around about what we're going to do next, that it, uh, you know, it got kind of splintered into tribes that were much more feeling-based, uh, uh, anti-capitalist, even anti-liberal, and then as you put it, anti-civilizational, that in some sense we need to see all of the apparatus of civilization as, as, as corrupt, as causing false consciousnesses, that we need to, uh, to basically blow the whole thing up or subvert the whole thing, go back to some sort of tribal group identities and feel our way forward. Yeah, so does this explain something like, you know, the anti-objectivity, uh, the anti-reason, uh, the anti-truth uh, movement, in effect, that's underway the, the, of the woke crowd? Yeah. I think I think it does in part. I mean, there's always those who are anti-reason, uh, anyways, because you know it's 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 too much work. <laughs> yeah, they don't want to engage in it. Right? They just uh, they, they they have their value set. They have their passions. They have their sense of idea, and they they in some senses they're too lazy, but also they just want the commitment and the sense of of felt commitment. That I think is uh, as old as humankind. And there are political versions of that, romantic, political, uh, religious, and so on versions of that. So that's, 
you know, a temptation, I think, that's built into human psychology more, more generally, and we see various movements of that. What I think uh, uh, is added by the postmodern left mm -hmm. and those in the last couple of generations is a more sophisticated rejection of that. So there, it's not just, you know, I'm not into all of this high theory and reasoning and logic and math stuff. I just want to feel what I want to feel. What you find there are very sophisticated academic arguments deployed against reasoning and logic and mathematics. And I think that uh, has to come from a different psychological place. You don't put that much work into attacking reason uh, if you've got, unless you've got something else that's going on as well. And I think part of that something else that's going on is, uh, you, know, you, know, you, you were signaling it, is political. That it is interesting that the, the worst manifestations of irrationalism and anti-rationalism in the last two generations have come from the left. They don't have a monopoly on it, but it has been a primarily left-wing phenomenon. And uh, so then I think you have to get inside what's been going on on the left, starting in the 1950s and 1960s, going from a time when they were very optimistic that you know, Marx had shown the way that Lenin and Stalin in the Soviet Union were showing the way that Mao even in China were showing the way. And then when all of that collapsed, there is a kind of uh, dispiritedness. If you have an ideal that you really believe and you think you've got good arguments and evidence for it, uh, but it's just not working out. How do you respond to that collapse of your ideals? And one of the things that people can do is, uh, is go on the offensive against the idea that they need to justify and argue and deal with counter evidence and, and so forth. So I think that's part of it as well. Yes, I mean, that makes me think about in your book, uh, Explaining Postmodernism, where you talk about the crisis of faith that happened yeah. in the counter enlightenment and the postmodernism is effectively a similar crisis of faith. Yeah, well, yeah, thanks, thanks for that plug for my, uh, for my book. But yes, uh, I, I, I do make the analogy. So during the enlightenment of the, especially of the, the 1700s, kind of the long 18th century, uh, you know, reason and science and the idea that we can really figure out the way the world works and we don't need to be all mystical and say, you know, God works in mysterious ways uh, is on the rise. And that was one of the great centuries of natural theology, uh, argumentation, where we take all of the arguments for the existence of God. And if we say that there's something that's, you know, good in religion, uh, we should be able as reasonable human beings to look at the evidence and the arguments and kind of prove our way to a reasonable Christianity uh, using, using the Western version. Uh, so there's a huge uh, energy devoted to looking at the best arguments for the existence of God against the existence of God in the 1700s, and it's, it reaches a high level of, of, of sophistication. I don't think it's ever been better than it was in the, in the 1700s. But what you then find is, uh, as the Enlightenment is developing, uh, and all of this argumentation is going on, the, the advocates of traditional religion come to realize that they are, they're losing the debates. Right, yeah, that uh, yeah. the arguments for the existence of God, they they really don't work. Now, I'm just not going to say to anybody listening, don't take my word for it. Don't take this as an article of faith. You know, do 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 the work. But yeah. you know, as a journalistic point about the 18, uh, 18th century, you know, most philosophers, secular and most religious philosophers and theologians came to recognize that you can't prove the existence of God. In fact, that the arguments against the existence of God are much more, much more compelling. So then you do have to make a, a, a judgment call in kind of in the privacy of your own mind. You know, if I really am committed to evidence and logic and figuring out the truth about the way the world is, and it seems that the best arguments are going against religion, then what I need to do is become agnostic or atheist and, and, and at the very least, uh, abandon my uh, the religion of my youth and find a more rational kind of belief system. But yeah. if your yeah. deepest uh, uh, kind of psychological commitments are going to be to say, no, 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 I know what I believe and I know what I want to believe. And if it seems that the enlightenment and argumentation is going against what I really want to believe, then to put it bluntly, to hell with reason, to hell with logic, to hell with the enlightenment. And then we get a counter enlightenment and people will invest significant intellectual energy to try to say that they don't need to be logical, we don't need to look at the evidence, we don't need to be rational, and so on. And that is certainly one of the major 
themes feeding into a very robust counter-enlightenment and anti-enlightenment movement that started to develop and pick up steam in the early 1800s. So to, to, to make the parallel to postmodernism, uh, if you go to left politics in the 1950s, and this is going to be the generation when all of the first generation big names in postmodernism, they are young men, and a few of them are young women, getting very good philosophical educations, very politically active, some of them going so far as to join the communist parties, right, and so forth. Uh, and so they have this vision of what they take to be a beautiful society that is, uh, that is wonderful, and we just uh, need to wrap our minds around it and commit it to, uh, to bringing about the revolution and everything is going to go to go well. Uh, and that comes to form really their, their, their core identity as, as, as human beings. But then if you are at the same time smart and looking at the really good arguments about capitalism and socialism and liberalism versus authoritarianism and the actual track records of what's going on in Hungary and a little bit later in Czechoslovakia and all along in, uh, uh, in the Soviet Union and so forth. And you know whatever your complaints are about liberal capitalism, you know people are you know getting air conditioners and buying cars and going to the movies and and things seem to be pretty good. So it's very hard to maintain your belief that capitalism is the worst of the worst and that everybody is being exploited and made mis made miserable there, and that some sort of socialism is the great shining city on the hill that is going to save the world, and you can believe in that. So there's a kind of crisis of faith among the most intelligent. And, uh, and, and to that point, still open to reason and evidence thinkers on the far left. And when you read the primary sources in the 1950s, there is this sense of, of doom and gloom and disillusionment. And uh, you know, the, the, uh, you know, it's exactly the same psychological manifestation of individuals who have had a beautiful vision of what a religious life can be, and it all comes crashing down in on them, and they just can't believe it anymore. And then various kinds of irrationalist faith responses, I think, come out of that. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And it reminds me of Herbert Marcuse or the Frankfurt School in general, which I think, you know, maybe inaugurated some of this uh, in terms of the postmodernists. For example, like the, the lament that they had that, you know, the consumers were actually getting better lives, that people were actually having better standard of living. And this was a Damn it. <laughs> crisis for them. They, they thought right. this is terrible. And they even called it totalitarian in yeah. one dimensional yeah. man, Herbert Marcuse. Yeah. You know, there's another element that you and I as academics are, are familiar with, kind of our great occupational hazard of. You know, we buy into a theory, a buy into a hypothesis, mm -hmm. and it's so beautiful and lovely, and uh, uh, and it just captures our whole imagination, and it's hard to think outside of that. Right. And but then because you know we're uh, most of us pretty clever, we can always find some way to you know <laughs> put in a box uncomfortable evidence or rationalize some evidence or or reconstruct the jigsaw puzzle for a little while right. to make it seem like the problems go away. So. I think part of what's going on with Frankfurt School is these are, you know, high theory academic guys right. uh, you know, who, who like never stepped outside of their offices. You almost sense that they don't really know that there's a world outside of the of the academic world. Although, uh, you know, throw a little dig in at it when things were going bad in Germany in the 1930s and everybody uh, who had some foresight was getting out of Germany. You would think that all of these left-leaning academics would, you know, get on the train or get on the bus and go east into the Soviet Union exactly. for the workers' paradise. Except every single one of them, without exception, went to the west. They went to England and they went to to America. So there's something a little bit disingenuous going on there as well. And then they sat out at Berkeley with smoking their pipes and ripping on Western civilization. And yeah, that's right. About how oppressed they and everybody are. Right. Excellent. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I hadn't thought of it that way before. Mm. So um, where do you think we are right now in terms of like what level of danger are we in? Uh, we, see yeah. a re we see a resurgence of some kind of socialism through uh, the woke movement and through Antifa and uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. And we're, we're seeing this kind of a uh, socialist resurgence in politics, you know, um, through, you know, it seems the Democratic Party has uh, 
has succumbed to a socialist undertow. Yeah. Uh, how, what kind of danger, like relatively speaking, historically, how do we yeah. gauge the danger we're in? Yeah, that's a question I want to put to you two to get your, your sense on that in part or particular, because here, one thing we can do is anecdotally point out all the problems, you know, what's going right. on in the high arts world. And, uh, you know, in this particular, you know, uh, gender studies uh, program, right, or, or whatever, and it's spilling over into legal studies and various laws are proposed and politics seems to have taken a cruder direction and so on. Uh, and it's very hard to say whether we are just sensitized to those issues, you know, being yeah. intellectuals of a certain sort who notice and are looking for canaries in various right. coal mines. Right. So we, we raise various flags. Uh, but at a certain point, it seems to be more than just anecdotal. There are patterns and, 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 and shifts. Yeah. And people who are not normally political or particularly attuned to intellectual issues, they come to be aware of them, that there's something problematic there. And that seems to indicate mm. that it's not just in high theory or even in the universities, that it's getting out into the culture in various ways. Uh, and another factor, of course, is the obvious one that you know, 30 years ago, you know, when you and I were young, we were yeah. just reading books uh, 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 and, and there was no internet yet. Right. So maybe this is a first generational phenomenon of just huge amounts of stuff going out on the internet and bad news sells, the most sensationalist stuff sells and gets out there and gets batted around. So it's very hard, I think, to get uh, the, the numbers to put to it. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, there's a lot of sickness, psychological sickness, mm -hmm. social sickness, intellectual corruption that's going on, mm -hmm. but whether that's one or two percent that has an amplified voice and perhaps a, a, a good set of institutional perches from which they can leverage some things, but it's still a minority and the vast majority of people are still basically rational, civil, decent uh, yeah. human beings. Or, or, or whether the numbers are much bigger. And I don't have good numbers on that. Uh, but I do think uh, it's, it's more than 2%. But mm -hmm. then again, the difference between 2% and 12% and, and is a pretty big difference. And yeah. uh, once, once you start getting into double digits, you can start leveraging in various ways. I mean, on the uh, other that, hand, the Bolsheviks were a minority. In, in wait, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so I think that's that's an important point that uh, almost all major movements in history, uh, they might use the masses and mass movements at various points, but they're never initiated by mass movements. The, the groundwork is gener laid by intellectuals, and it's always a small, small minority of intellectuals who, uh, who mm -hmm. have a vision, they have a strategy, and they, they know how to use people. So... Um, even if it's not a mass movement, if it's a significantly organized minority movement, that can be equally dangerous. And that's yeah. certainly also what history teaches us. Good point. Let's think about the, you know, the education system a little bit. Talk about yeah. that K through 12 and higher education. Um, yeah. They seem to be, you know, I mean, it, it looks pretty dire to me that it's being shot through with some pernicious ideologies, not only are they uh, informing uh, policies, but they're, in, they're also infiltrating the actual disciplines, yeah. many disciplines, and even threatening uh, the sciences and uh, the ma in math, you know. Um, yeah. We're being told there's no right answer in math, you know, uh, that the, the saying there's a right answer is racist, uh, yeah. that, uh, you know, uh, grammar is racist. Uh, basically, everything is racist. Right. And and likewise, there's a there seems to be a real th uh, threat that the integrity of 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 these pursuits is being threatened. What do you yes. what do you what do you well, well, clearly, the integrity of uh, these pursuits is being threatened, and that's at least in higher education a self conscious part of the part of the strategy. So what we know about academics is they're, they're very good with words. Mm -hmm. And uh, for them, you know, they're, they're not uh, in the streets activists. They're not, they're not criminals. They're not politicians. They're not in the military. Uh, they, they use words. And if you have a certain philosophical orientation that says human beings are locked into these 
uh, zero sum adversarial till death do us part uh, 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 wars and battles, then yeah. you are going to see words as weapons. Yeah. You're going to become very good at using words as weapons. And one way of doing that is to use words not necessarily in a way that you think is true or empirically verifiable. And certainly we know uh, postmodernism and its offshoots say you don't have to worry about that. Uh, so mm -hmm. you set that aside. Yeah. So rather you use words uh, uh, as, as weapons. And what you're doing is you're trying to see what words will expose your enemy's weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And then uh, anytime you spot a weakness, that's where you 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 attack, you exploit yeah. right as much as possible. So uh, at one level, of course, there are going to be some true believers who believe that, uh, you know, they're in their ideological bubbles, that we live in the worst sexist times in history or the worst racist times in history, right, and so on. I don't think those people are, are very bright. I think they do, a, they do have a role. They don't have any arguments. They are, uh, they've just heard a theory and they're just, you know, making their career based on ad advocating that, that theory. I think the more dangerous ones, though, are those who know very well that we, uh, we've made great strides against racism and slavery and sexism and uh, that we live in basically a decent society and that most people are decent human beings, but they don't care about that. Right? Mm -hmm. What they are is adversarially committed to destroying the society, including all of the decent people who are in the society in order to remake it a certain way. But what they have learned is that decent people in our society are very sensitive Mm -hmm. uh, they take their morality very seriously, you know, that I want to, people to be free and have opportunities and be treated with respect and sexism is evil and racism is evil. And, and that's the way these people are. So they're going to be very sensitive to any accusations that anything they say or do or that the system that they believe in has some elements of racism or sexism in it. So the people who are the rhetorical enemies against them who are very promiscuously throwing around these terrible insults. You know, you're a racist, that's sexist, this, that, and the other thing. They know what they're doing, but they're not doing it uh, in the sense of saying that I think this is true and you should think this is true either. Instead, it's being used to put you on the defensive, to make you feel guilty, to make you feel ashamed because people who are guilty and ashamed are much easier to manipulate and control. So it's a matter of rhetoric being deployed in a certain adversarial adversarial kind of context. Now, how dangerous this is, and this is this is your question. Uh, you know, I think uh, the most serious issues still are in higher education, uh, but you know, K through twelve is is starting to be affected significantly, um, and partly there's a generational thing, and then there's partly a splitting up of the academic turf thing. So we can say, you know, it's worst in the humanities. You know, it's not as bad in the social sciences and it's not bad really at all yet in the, in the hard sciences. So the hard sciences is still a, a strong enlightenment modernist project and they've got good institutional uh, uh, roots and a good institutional ethos to, to help them be protected yeah. against that. And of course, you can get very fine grained inside the humanities. Some some uh, subsectors of the humanities really are just terrible ghettos. There's, there's, there's no scholarship at all being done there. They're just activist training camps and so on. Some sectors are, are not so bad. Some sectors are, are pretty healthy. Uh, but uh, to come to the generational point, you know, people like Foucault, Rorty, Lyotard, Derrida, and the others, they were most active in the 60s and 70s right. uh, and uh, you know, came to high prestige in their academic disciplines. All of them were philosophers by training, PhDs. And I think that that's uh, an important part of the sophistication and power and depth of their, their arguments. But what they had done by the time you get to the 80s and 90s is trained a whole next generation of the younger professoriate. And many of them then went into the other disciplines. So it's in the 90s, at least on my reading of the timeline, that you start to see kind of well-trained theoreticians about education. Now in the education schools, 
mm. starting to say, well, we need to you know, shift our focus on what it means to train the teachers and what the curriculum should look like and what methodologies we should be using and what assessment should be and even you know, the architectural layout of buildings and so on. So all of the things that education theorists think about, but you start to see postmodern trained education theorists having an impact in the uh, the education schools and then of course you know 80 or 90 percent of all kids in the us at canada are, are go to public schools and so all of those teachers have to get certified in uh, in, in education schools and so uh, then you have a generation of retraining the teachers in a certain direction mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then they go out and start teaching a certain way and it's not until i've again by my reading of the timeline maybe late 2008 on through mm -hmm. 2012 that you start seeing mission statements of education schools yeah. and various kinds of uh, <laughs> well to put it bluntly loyalty oaths and, yeah. and signing on to postmodern creeds right being uh, put in place in the education school so that every teacher who goes through that particular education school has to sign on to a kind of postmodern leftism or social justice warriorism or wokeism of some sort. And then five years later, it all goes really big and we're all aware of it through social media. So I think that's a that's a, a big danger. And I worry more about that one than I do about what's happening in say high art or what's yeah. happening even in politics or what's happening in legal circles, even though there are some, some dangers there. Yeah, I agree with you there that uh, the academy, see, uh, I think it's been able to hide its role as an ideological apparatus by virtue of being, you know, hiding in plain sight because it's been deemed, you know, the ivory tower and something that's isolated and that mm. nothing that goes on there. I mean, I heard this just, you know, three, five years ago, people saying, well, but who cares what's going on there? They're isolated. This is the ivory tower. I said, I said no, you, you've got to understand mm. this is where everything starts. This yeah. is this is the, where the dissemination of these ideas begins. And um, it's really now, of course, it's proliferated everywhere. It's, and it's pervading even mm. uh, the military, the intelligence agencies, the, of course, K through 12, but, you know, the broader cor corporate America as well. But let's talk about how postmodernism fits in here. This is one of the things that I've been trying to puzzle over, and I like yeah. some of your explanations. Is how does this epistemology, which claims to be anything goes, effectively, you know, relativism, subjectivism, uh, you know, uh, anti-objectivity, how does it articulate with politics such that it becomes this authoritarianism? How does yeah. this happen? Yeah. Well, I think that that's hard. I think in part, it's a mixture of uh, philosophy and, and psychology. And here I'm thinking of psychology as, because uh, we're, we're smart beings. We have this, this big brain and our big brain is relatively unformed when we are, we are young. But as we grow, we come to think in terms of principles and abstractions. And we, in effect, put together our, our philosophy of life. And because life is so complicated, we, we use our philosophy as a set of principles to help us navigate all sorts of complexities right? Right. And, and, and so on. So uh, training one's mind to be able to think about evidence and counter argument and uh, what counts as the benefit of uh, a, a, a beyond a reasonable doubt when we can use certainty, when we can uh, you know, indulge certain emotions when we need to restrain our emotions, setting long-term plans. All of that is a very huge project. And I think that's why with the human young, you know, we don't just birth them in the spring, let them play around for the summer and grow up and then they're on their own by the fall. You know, we, we take 15, 16, 17, 18 years to train their minds to take on the complexities of adult, adult life. So if you have a highly skeptical, relativistic, mm. Uh, ultimately nihilistic philosophical movement that comes along and basically says to people, your mind is, is impotent, right? Everybody is basically just a grasping animal full of strong desires. And mm. most people are just clever at finding ways to bullshit you into believing what they want to, or mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, you know, making you put, let your guard down so before they stab you in the back, right? And so forth. So if you come to believe 
a highly irrational list, uh, adversarial, cynical philosophy of life. Yeah. Then that, of course, is going to be an abstract set of principles you will carry around and apply it in all of the different areas of life. But it comes to be operationalized in your in your psychology. If you don't think that evidence and reasoning matters very much, right. then you're not going to do the really hard work of learning how to reason and do logic very well. Right. I think what that's going to do is by the time you are an adult and you realize how complicated the world is, you're going to realize that you're not really ready to take the world on, right? That you are just not up to speed and you don't, you don't feel competent or able to do so. And at the same time, you think that you're dealing cynically with a bunch of other basic animals who are organized into various groups. And because of your group membership, they just hate you. And they right. want to keep you down and everything, you know, dream that has not come true in your life is somebody else's fault and the man is going to keep you down. That's just going to poison you, right, as a, as a young person. So this is long story short and, you know, postmodernism is this big sprawling intellectual movement. Right. But if you take it and run it to the end, that's the kind of human beings I think it, it creates. It, yeah. So how do you get authoritarianism out of that? I don't think it's automatic. Uh, I think a lot of people who drink deeply from the postmodern well, uh, they just become poisoned inside and they kind of withdraw from life and they just give up on anything. And they just go into some little corner and uh, just kind of hope to get through or just muddle through their muddle through their lives. But I think other people, particularly young people, uh, there's something beautiful about human nature that when we are young, we, we, uh, we want our lives to be meaningful and significant. Right. Right. And uh, you know, no matter how jaded and cynical the messages are we are hearing, there is still enough in you know, American culture, Canadian culture, where I'm from, broadly Western and even world culture now, that's optimistic and energizing. So people grow up with this sense that they, they want to have a meaningful life. They want to do something, damn it, and, and, and make a difference and, and have this feeling of significance. But I think if they believe that they are in an adversarial culture and logic and evidence and reasoning and being civil is not where they're at, then what they're going to say in the privacy of their, their, uh, their meaning of life moments is, well, here's what I happen to believe. These are the things that, that push my buttons. And right. I'm just going to make a subjective commitment to them and jump into the fray. If it's a jungle battleground war out there, I'm just gonna jump into that battle and whatever tools and weapons I find available to me, I'm going to use them. And uh, I might as well be authoritarian because in a dog eat dog jungle, it's going yep. to be, you know, the, this is a little bit unfair to dogs, but <laughs> it is going to be the biggest nastiest dog uh, in the junkyard that's going to prevail. So it might as well be me rather than you. So some sort of authoritarianism is going to come out. I agree. Uh, so like Foucault's notion of truth, and it's basically the, you know, what plausible narratives uh, inflected by power. Power mm. is really everything is, whatever is established as true is based on power. So it's all power all the way down. There's yep. no objective criteria. It's all power. So yep. this makes people assert power. They try to, uh, they see people having things based, they see it totally based on power. And they think that the only way to counter it is by, employing power against it right yep absolutely yep so yeah so uh, uh, you know, i take seriously neat uh, uh uh foucault's line in one of his interviews where he uh he says you know basically you know i've read all of these guys and uh, then he singles out the the people who are the most significant in his thinking and heidegger is is certainly one of them marxism and various kinds of neo-marxism right is another Right. But uh, he does say, basically, I'm a Nietzschean. Right. Uh, and what we know from Nietzschean politics uh, and Nietzschean ethics, Nietzschean cultural analysis, is that it's power all the way down. It's the will to power. Right. And then what you need to do is just channel your, your, your instinctual, whatever energies that you have in a direction that seems genuine and meaningful to you and become the most powerful agent you can for that. And that, of course, includes stomping all over other people with their own will to power agenda. So, uh, yes. So then various normative concepts like truth. That's a 
that's a normative concept in epistemology, kind of a value right. standard to strive for, or, right. or beauty, or dignity, or rights, or justice. All of them in the Nietzschean slash Foucauldian analysis get reduced to power struggles. Uh, right. So it's a it's a it's a very hardcore reductionism, and those end up gen just being really just pretty words overlaying an underlying power struggle. So yes, well, we have a bunch of practical postmodernists out there. Basically, they've mm. they've effectively become. Yeah, so I, I've said that social justice warriors are just practical postmodernists. This is practical postmodernism and postmodernism put into action. Yeah. Well, I think that's right. Um, uh, I think it's not the only form that postmodernism can take. I mean, you can right. come to think that everything is amoral power struggles and based on subjective values, but it just happens to be generationally that the, the constellation of values that fit mm -hmm. into what we call the social justice warrior mindset, those ones have great cultural currency. So the numbers dictate that lots of people are going to, to, uh, to fall into that camp, but it could be you know, from some other branch of the political sure. spectrum or the sure, religious absolutely. Spectrum, you know, some have said Trump was a, a, was a postmodern president, in effect. Right. Yeah, sure. Uh, let me uh, yeah, put that back on you, because uh, yeah. we were talking about K through 12 uh, right. and, and, and higher education. And I know that, uh, from, you know, from reading your book, for example, which I've got here and, and I enjoyed, Thank you. Uh, I have to say, I found it uh, you know, partly amusing in a, in a dark way because I, I recognize some of, the, some of the characters you've encountered, but at the right. same time, it's, uh, it's dispiriting to recognize that you know, in the academic world that you and I you know, made our careers in and we love and we, you know, you know, truth, beauty, goodness, and figuring things out and training the younger generation that really minds or matters rather, not, not to be able to... Uh, to feel good and about the, our institutional home, it's right. uh, it's kind of kind of distressing and to, to to see how deep the the rot is and how blatant it is in some cases. But you're you're more politically savvy, I think, than I am on a lot of these issues. So Trump and Biden, and so another question then would be: To what extent do you think post, uh, politics, American politics, has taken a postmodern turn? as a result of the kinds of nonsense, dangerous nonsense that we've been dealing with in the academic world. Yeah, I think it's it, 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 in a broader way, even beyond like party politics, but just, you know, the kind of political landscape that we inhabit, including the, the media and, and so forth. I think the media and the, the broad political uh, ethos of our time is a postmodern one in the sense that this, it's a post-truth environment in which effectively there is no real belief in anything, uh, in any veracity. And, and so there's a kind of underlying cynicism that uh, whatever I can assert and get away with, if I have the requisite power to, to assert it and, and, and get it enforced in effect, then that's good enough. And this seems to be the ethos of the New York Times all the way through every, almost every major media platform. And uh, Trump, I got to say the same thing. Uh, Biden, uh, the, the same thing. It's like, we know these aren't truth statements, but there's no one powerful enough to challenge them. Likewise, we can get away with saying them and get away with imposing this, this belief on other people. And then we can create policies based on this. That's how mm -hmm. I think it goes. Okay. Well, uh, let me let me ask kind of as a follow up on this concept of post truth in uh, in politics. You know, in one way, what's going on now is not really any different from what was going on, say, a hundred years ago or two hundred years ago in the republics and the and, and the democracies. Mm -hmm. And so. Why wouldn't we just say, well, look, everybody knows that politicians are bullshitters. Right. We've always known that politicians are bullshitters. Right. And everybody knows that politicians are corrupt. They make election promises that they have no intention of, of doing. In order to make uh, be successful in an election, you have to put a coalition together and you make all kinds of promises that you know very well you're, you're going to go back on. Uh, and at the same time, you've got all of your cronies and the people who are connected to you, they're going to be rewarded in various ways. Right. And that whatever the situation is, 
po politicians are always going to have a kind of a good news version and they come up with pretty labels for yeah. whatever their program is but really there's a dark seething underbelly and you know it's it's a sausage making machine and you know that's some pretty nasty stuff going on inside the sausage maker however pretty so why is this generation any different if for centuries we've known politicians are corrupt, they're bullshitters, and it's just a sausage machine? Yeah, I think it has to do with this idea that facticity itself is being uh, is being denied, that the, there's, there's, there's almost the ability to say the exact opposite of what's happening and to get it mm -hmm. passed off as true so that um, you can actually assert almost anything that's opposed to the facts or what what are what are what are revealed to be facts or what are established as facts that can can be established as facts and nevertheless pass it off and put a narrative forth that it is utterly denying of the facts so there's a gaslighting going on yeah if you will a gaslighting where people are being told to deny their very senses <laughs> you know uh, for example, I mean, this is not anything that, against transgender people or anything like that, but transgenderism, for example, how it is possible to actually force people to say, okay, I agree with what you say, whatever you say you are, you are, and I have to abide by it. And I must also abide by the pronouns that you, might, you, you impose on me. And I must pretend like you are something that you aren't, at least from the standpoint of conventional senses, uh, you know, my sensibilities, my, my, my sense of, the, of, of what I know to be factually true in some sense, that all the way, you know, in your chromosomes, you have XY or XX chromosome or XXY in some cases, I don't deny inter intersex people that exist, but there's this sense in which we must uh, abdicate our convictions to uh, what we know to be the fact. And this is different, I think. Maybe I'm wrong. Mm, okay. Yeah, so the, the notion of the questioning of facticity and the browbeating of people into denying their own judgment and in some cases, the evidence of their own eyes. Right. That uh, does come out of a kind of a politicized tradition. So, you know, we can Obviously, there are religious versions of that as well, but certainly sure. political versions of well. So why those are more operative now, we can then go back to talking about postmodernism and, and other kinds of strategies as well. But uh, along the way, you were talking about uh, some journalistic outlets. So if we go back a couple of generations and people would say, OK, politicians are, are bullshitters and there's lots of cronyism and, and corruption and so on. Right. But we still at that point have a more idealistic understanding of journalism mm -hmm. and the role of journalists and, and, and uh, newspapers then and, and television shows of repute that they build their reputation right. on. We present the facts. We present arguments on both sides. Uh, you know, we might have our position, but we're going to at least make an argument for it. And we're not just going to try to manipulate uh, and manipulate, you know, so. The idea then is if we have other sectors of our culture, like the journalistic culture, healthy, right, uh, committed to objectivity and truth and, and rights and decency, then they can serve as a check on All the, that, on the political on, on the on the bad politicians. So we're going to you know celebrate uh, you know Woodward and Bernstein, right, who exposed the corruption, say, of the, the Nixon administration, right? Right, right, and so forth. So uh, it's also then natural to then think, well, the new generation of technology should make us more optimistic about that. Yeah. Because now it's not just the New York Times and CBS News and various uh, places. We have this huge explosion in, in cable TV networks and everybody can become their own investigative reporter. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've got the whole internet and we have Wikipedia uh, and so now instead of just a few institutionalized journalistic organs, uh, people have access to so much information and power that we should be in a better epistemic situation sure, in this generation. Sure. So what do you think has happened then to make us uh, <laughs> think, well, you know, the fact that something's on the internet or yeah. that I, I can't right. trust it, right? Or even right. the New York Times has perhaps become corrupted beyond a certain point. Uh, and and, and I'm, I'm, I'm effectively being gaslit 
by my own uh, devices, so to speak. Yeah, I think it has to do with the fact that, that this proliferation of alternate media has made the, the sort of mainstream or official or more powerful or longstanding, uh, you know, legacy media trump up their uh, push up the, the notches of what, what comes out to be eventually propaganda by virtue of trying to counter what mm. they see as possible alternatives. And mm -hmm. so they just uh, amp up the, the propaganda element so that you don't even, they don't even apologize anymore. There's no, there's not even any sense of concession to facts and uh, to alternate views. They just have to amp it up because mm. they have to counter this fake news everywhere, right? This, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, so, so fake news becomes everything in effect because they are willing to say, look, we have to tow this particular line and this has to be enforced and we must enforce this view no matter what. And we won't concede any points uh, in order to do it. And so that, uh, that I think explains it, the proliferation mm. of you know, media everywhere uh, we're in an infosphere that's constant and, uh, and, 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 you know, it's ubiquitous. So mm -hmm. in, that, in that ubiquitous infosphere, uh, the, ma the mainstream or what legacy media has had to, uh, to become more, uh, I should say, I, I think, propagandistic, really. Mm. Okay. So... <sighs> I know you have some libertarian sympathies and I have mm -hmm. some libertarian sympathies as well. Right. So, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but one way of making a variation of the argument you just made is then to say, so the internet comes along and there's a proliferation of uh, technologies and media, larger consumer base, uh, and the cost of information goes way down. But we do have the legacy media and they have say a first mover advantage. Right. They're already institutionalized and they've got reserves of cash right. in order to, to, to leverage this. So then we could apply a kind of, and it sounds like a leftish argument, that the newcomers and the little guy really doesn't have a chance to compete with the, the big established legacy media that's already got huge amounts of money in the bank. And so they can just leverage themselves into a monopoly position mm -hmm. and... Uh, ram their version of the truth down people's throats. Yeah. And also, if it turns out that there's a huge market out there and it's bad news that sells and sensationalist news that sells, and we just right. give people garbage and, and then they will do so. Now, the standard response to that, though, is then to just to cite the long history of innovation that you know, two guys in a garage can mm -hmm. take on the IBMs of the world, right? Sure. Or Henry Ford can be tinkering in his backyard shed and take on the more established automakers uh, and big motor makers as well. So why, uh, if there is a demand for truth mm -hmm. or goodness for value and so on, why has the, um, the proliferation, say, of a certain set of views on one side of the fence not generated uh, equal uh, numbers of views on the other side. So then we still have a balanced kind of media. I, or, I think it has. If it's clear yeah. that, the, that the, the legacy medias are not delivering truth anymore, that there's you know, the rise, it's an entrepreneurial opportunity for mm -hmm. startups to come along and say, we will give you truth and we will have real fact checkers and so on. So why do you think that's not happening? Or Well, I think, I think it is happening. Um, it's just because it is happening. I think it's it's impelled. It's compelled these legacy media and as institutions at large, even academia, to to amp up their efforts to reestablish or maintain their hegemony over yeah. the over the information sphere. And so they're just acting as traditional monopolists will act. Uh, absolutely. Okay. All right. And some cases, right, you, uh, you, you might have been entrepreneurial in your growth phase, you get a big, large, large market share, but then you'll do anything you can anything, to shut out the competition, including, to cut it out, including running to government to ask for a seat at the table. And, you know, we'll promise you various things if you will scratch our back and keep the competition right. out of business. So okay. there's, yes, there's collusion between the state and the, and these monopolists. That's always yes. the way it goes. That's, That's the libertarian right. argument about that too. Right. So uh, I don't want to ask you to do too much crystal ball gazing, but uh, how do you think that's 
going to play out. And we're really talking about three cultural fronts now, education, politics, and journalism. Uh, and so, uh, uh, let's uh, start with journalism. Uh, obviously, we, we go on social media and uh, there's a lot of good stuff, but there's a lot of crap. Right. So do you think we are just still in the early stages and in, in 10 years uh, will be healthier or do you see it as a downward spiral that's not recoverable? Well, I don't want to place my own uh, projection. I don't want to place my own hopes into this. I, I hope you know, very strongly that it will actually, that it will, you know, regenerate and that we'll come out with um, a more uh, veridical system of information and education and, and so on and so forth. But I think, uh, you know, based on historical, uh, historical records and, a, you know, historical precedents, uh, it could get worse first. And, you know, like I think it's very possible that we're going to keep tipping towards socialism for quite a while and then it will collapse because it can't work. We know that mm. uh, the planned economies can't work because that it, it, it's this imposition of, of planning over top of uh, all, you know, consumer desiderata is not is not going to leave a robust middle class that feeds the economy. Mm. Similarly, in the infosphere, it can't last, but how long is the question, I guess? To me, it could last a yeah. bit longer, you know, maybe 10, 20 more years. I think probably 20. Yeah. Huh. Okay, yeah, that, you know, that's an unfair uh, crystal ball gazing exercise. I'm well, asking you to- Well, I've sort of made my uh, reputation out of being a little bit of a prognosticator, so I don't- All right, well, fair enough, yeah. yes. Yeah. Well, I know I my record is uh, is more mixed. I'm one of those people who did not predict that Donald Trump would become president. I also did not predict that uh, Joe Biden would become president when I first uh, encountered those individuals. I was like, no way. <laughs> yeah. So uh, my my political judgment acumen is not to not to tarp right, but also even with respect to postmodernism, mm -hmm. you know, I wrote my book on postmodernism in the the late '90s and published it. Uh, you know, uh, over, uh, almost 20 years ago now, wow. and my sense was that postmodernism was tired and old. Yes, and, that was you know, the... maybe it was just a kind of a naivety uh, that you know, since it's ultimately nihilistic and crap, nobody's going to really take it too seriously. And that within 10 or 15 years, we'll be in a healthier place. But that does not seem to be to, to be the case uh, either. But of course, the issue is that it's not necessarily. Uh, thriving in the serious academic right. places. The high theory ages over, and yet it's now yeah. become uh, what we're in a kind of pedestrian level. Uh, That's right. So it's mostly in the academic departments that, frankly, don't have much reputation. They don't have a lot of students because smart people recognize it's not it's not very uh, interesting. And one of the yeah. things about intellectuals is they like new arguments and they like right. uh, the right. sense that uh, something is going is going somewhere. Um, so uh, I know you have your own entrepreneurial project with respect to higher education. Yeah. Um, uh, do you sense that the, the, the shakeup that's going on in higher education, a lot of people are trying lots of entrepreneurial things mm -hmm. that the, the kind of the legacy institutions will survive or will they be swept away or somewhere in the middle? What's your sense? I, I don't think they'll be swept away, but in order for them to, to have a reformation, which I think is necessary, there needs to be pressure put on them by parallel institutions, parallel po possibilities, other types of, uh, uh, other types of uh, enterprises like the one I'm involved in. Now, again, this may cause them to actually double down on their absurdities. And that's very possible that they'll try to double down on the absurdities in order to maintain their status. And so they may use, which seems to me to be the case that, you know, they're using their wokeness as a kind of uh, prestige value. Like the woker you are, the better you are. And so yeah. wokeness still has a prestige value. So it may actually amp it up a bit first. Mm -hmm. Just as in the media is amping up its, uh, its propagandistic function, I think, similarly, pressure from other parallel institutions or parallel enterprises may cause academia to double down, amp up their uh, 
woke uh, their wokeness and their policies and, you know, continue to, you know, degrade uh, the standards and to, uh, you know, make everything about race and gender and uh, transgenderism and, uh, you know, that maybe they'll even get to the point where they start handing out grades based on your identity, period. Mm. I mean, it's possible, <laughs> but... Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, I think to some extent, the uh, gradeflation does happen that way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, members of target groups, uh, you know, they do get admitted at higher rates. They get graded right. more easily and they get promotions more easily and so right. forth. So, um, you know, it's it's a uh, it's kind of it's a, it's a quiet scandal in many cultural yeah, sectors. It's not spoken of. You can't speak of it from within. That's for sure. Right. Could, yeah. Although, you know, at Yale University and other institutions where their data has come out, it's it's quite clear that that's a it is actually if institutional racism has a genuine meaning, those are good examples of exactly. institutional racism right there. But it, it, some words of, that in what you were just saying that jumped out at me were this uh, prestige factor that SJW yeah. has a prestige. There's a certain moral high ground. Right. And I wanted to ask you uh, why you think that set of attitudes has the moral high ground and whether uh, perhaps in uh, strategizing uh, about how best to confront it to kind of capture a different moral high ground. So if there's this victimhood and uh, you know, use of guilt and shame as a weapon uh, and dividing people into group identities and so forth, if somehow that has some moral prestige, mm -hmm. does it then point in the direction of saying, you know, what we need is to have people have a proper sense of pride, a proper sense of individual agency, right. and a healthy sense of self-esteem. And then that's a different kind of moral high ground for people to appeal to. Yeah, I think it's basically worked as a kind of virus on the value system that we have had established, you know, equality, liberty, uh, uh, individual rights and, you know, individual dignity and worth. So it's kind of, it's kind of been a parasite that's used those values and use them against us by virtue of saying, you know, uh, if you really want to live up to these values, you must go along with this, mm -hmm. that you must see that this is in, in there's this institutional, you know, discrimination, there's this institute systemic rot that, there, it's systemically, it's been biased all this time, or it's, it's systemically racist. And so it, it's, yeah. it's infiltrated that very value system that we have been upholding and using it against the people that hold it. And that's why it's mm. working. And yeah. that's why it's got prestige, because it's actually based on a more fundamental core set of values, which you and I yeah. both hold, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think that's a nice way of putting it. That it's parasitical or a ver ver virus-like behavior on a healthy set of values that people have. Yes. So probably this is why you know our work, you know, the people who are intellectuals and deal with words and conceptualization, uh, we need to do a, a better job. So absolutely, you know, justice is the legitimate concept, but then there's a perverted form of social justice, social justice that people yeah. get bamboozled into. Right? There are advantages, uh, some of them ill-gotten and some of them deserve it. But if everything just is privileges that are somehow socially dispensed to some upon others, then privilege comes to be uh, an anti-concept, right? right. You know, and everybody knows uh, pretty much racism is a bad thing. Right. But if you've got smuggled in your version of what actually looks to me like a kind of sneaky racism <laughs> yeah. or, or partial anti-racism, but bringing in another kind of uh, racism is then people uh, are going to be uh, bamboozled by it. Um, speaking of intellectuals, I, I imagine you get this question a lot from people who are younger, who are smart and uh, you know, they love history or they love the law or literature and they are thinking about careers as intellectuals or academics, but then mm. that means going to graduate school. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, we know what our colleagues are like. Some of them are wonderful human beings doing yeah. great work. A lot of them are second raters. A lot of them really are bad people doing bad work. Mm -hmm. So what uh, kind of advice do you give to younger uh, uh, people who want to make an intellectual difference? Yeah. I mean, 
I've often get asked, you know, should I go to graduate school? And it, you know, to tell you the truth, my answer is weighted by um, in terms of what their identity is. And isn't that a shame? Mm. Uh, well, you're a white, straight male. Your chances of getting a job are very slim. Uh, your likelihood of, of succeeding in academia are, is low, not because of any uh, in, you know, nothing about you in terms of your intellectual abilities really weighs into it. Unfortunately, it has to do with, and now there's differences according to fields too, though. I, I, I think that philosophy in the humanities is probably one of the last bastions of some virtuous values being held mm. up as important and that rigor is still maintained and that it's, you actually have to be able to do the work Although I think that is, uh, is threatened, frankly. I don't know, you would know better, but I would imagine that that's under threat too. Uh, so it depends on that. And then I say, you know, um, that there is life for the intellectual outside of academia. There is a life that you can maintain, that you can be rigorous and scholarly without being an academic per se. Mm. So I encourage those people, especially if they have the wrong identity, to consider that and to be what we call public intellectuals. And that's the route I've had to take since being effectively driven, well, you know, made miserable at NYU to the point where it was not livable. It was untenable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that, that I think is a value that we need to uphold. And there's, it's difficult that way because yeah. you don't have the institutional support. You don't get the, you know, uh, you don't get the acknowledgement that peer reviewing does accord and that peer reviewing is both intra-institutional and cross-institutional, intra yeah. and inter-institutional. You don't get that. So this leaves you subject to scrutiny, higher, higher scrutiny, I think. Mm. I was just reading a book by a philosopher who's not an academic philosopher. And I said uh, to the publisher, which I was reading it for review, and they asked my view on it. I said, well, you know, it might work for a philosopher within a department. But it's going to be very difficult for this person as a non-professional philosopher to be taken seriously with this book. Mm. And that's a problem. Uh, so in a way, we need to erect uh, some sort of institutional legitimacy outside of academia, I think, at this mm -hmm. point, because uh, without it, I'm afraid we'll just have nothing but it. And, um, and we know what the problems with that are right now. Yeah. I know we're running out of uh, time for our yeah. uh, our meeting, but let me yeah. just ask one more question uh, of you, kind of an advice kind of question for you know, thoughtful, intelligent people who yeah. are aware that there's a lot of bad stuff and dangerous stuff swirling around them in the culture. Yeah. But they have a life to live and they don't plan to become uh, intellectuals or, or academics. Yeah. What, what, uh, what kind of preserve your own psychological health uh, ideas or advice would you give to them or do you give to them? Yeah, I mean, I almost say that some degree of retreatism is nexus necessary for that. And mm. to try to have a balance of between, uh, you know, a sort of antiquarianism is almost required. Mm. To go back and get away from this stuff by reading alternate things. Get, go back and read a 19th century or 18th century novel. Mm. Go back and read something that's removed from this crisis material because this will eat you alive. It'll distort your perceptions of reality and it'll hurt your own psyche and mental health in the long mm. run. So that's okay. the kind of advice that I usually give. All right. Nicely said. Thank you. All right. Well, good discussion for an hour. I know we uh, covered a lot of territory and there's lots more that we well, uh, It was we great talking with you and to hear you talk uh, and put, the, put the, to you know, articulate some of the things that I've thought, but articulated better, I think. And I appreciate that very much. Well, same thing. It's all part of our division of labor. You That's have right. your specialty and I have my specialty. It's, it's a good compliment. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Well, let's do it again sometime. Excellent. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, Michael. Bye for now. Bye-bye.